For starting current arts wellness, we will see Valerie Kaplan presents twenty, and we'll finish it is a whole bit. There will be a event course after um there will be a Valerie discussion. We'll be happy performer, writer, journalist, and now also as a free producer, <laughs> um, we'll be moderating um, our own talk. So there will be a paper in between this um, place, place, and um, you can stay here, so nobody has to leave. Right. I thought I was doing it. I thought I knew how to be a good parent. I thought I was doing it so much better than my own parents because, to be honest with you, my own parents were really fucked up. But then I hit a roadblock. Well, more like a locked door. The door to my son's room. Oh, Never open. And late night calls from the and scary text messages. Very. And my kid is slipping away from me. And I don't have the answers. I don't know how to help my son. What's the problem here? My husband? School? The town we live in? Is it me? Might be partly me. Do everything at it. Therapists, tutors. It just got worse. And I wanted, okay, at the very least, I just wanted to feel like I'm not crazy. I'm not alone. Like there must be other kids like this. There must be other parents out there like this. What do they do? Michael! <coughs> Michael! Find it, Michael. Oh my God, Michael, just say your name. Taking a crap. I don't want to say my name. Okay, well, do you want me to watch you take a crap? Let me think. No. Okay, then just say your name when you're on a direction. Otherwise, I. All right. Okay. Or just my first name. <laughs> what? Michael or Paul? Just your first name is fine. Michael. So we can hear you back at camp. Michael! <laughs> Thanks so much for Skyping with me. I spoke to your son, he's so funny. Michael! I am really grateful you're sharing your story. Uh, so just for the video, can you say your name and your son's name? Barry Walsh. The name of your son? My son is Michael Walsh. His now is Michael! Can you turn the sound down on your end? It's a little echoey. Okay, now talk again. That's that better? It's a little better. <laughs> yeah. So he's... Nice. He's not 20. Went to second nature when he was 16. Michael! My son was 15, actually. So he's 15 now. He was 15 when he sent him, so... Um, um, what was going on that caused you to send Michael to Will? What were Michael's thoughts about the situation? My dad was a dick. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Michael. What was that again? I was a dick. I see. My parents wanted to get a divorce. Well, mom wanted to get a divorce, and my dad cleaned her out financially, and then they got the divorce, which bugged us, and then he didn't pay child support. So, you know, right, childhood? What does shitty look like? My ex on the couch, literally, um, had the TV on 24-7. Um, I worked from home at the time, so I couldn't leave. I was paying all the bills, and I tried to be evicted, so to speak, and the response was, if you take your kids and leave, you'll be arrested for kidnapping. Um, and so it was very passive-aggressive here. Michael lost his temper, my ex-husband would you know, tell him, good job, good job. So it was very dysfunctional, horrible, for three years. 
Michael lost his temper. What was that like? He would be very aggressive to me, hostile, screaming, yelling, swearing, um, threatening to me. I was throwing tam temper tantrums. I was like a three-year-old, even though he was. Um, And all that, I thought this was supposed to be about like little things. It's all part of the story. I mean, I would love to know about it up where you are, but only tell me as soon as you're comfortable. Just, I have to go soon, so. Okay. Can we set up another time to Skype? Uh, yeah, sure. You are. They have these support groups, webinars, all this stuff. And search for me, drama, the gifted child. But I'll try anything once. <laughs> Shit. The stuff that I did when I was a teenager, I would never tell my kid. People I slept with and drugs, drugs, drugs. Of course, it was the 70s. Survive. Honestly, things better or worse now than when I was young. But who, all I can think about is my son. The weather in Utah on my own this morning. Oh. I got some letters that Cole and Cole's mom sent back and forth. Pretty typical. <clears throat> Dear Cole, Please don't do this to me. So unnecessary. I don't even know why. I thought everything's been better. You are wondering why you are in the wilderness. Please don't do this to me. So unnecessary. I don't even know why. I thought everything's been better. There because we sent you there. I really didn't know what to expect. Like wilderness? I was actually really little factually about it. I guess I pictured something like the <laughs> uh, like a heated. Please don't do this to me. So unnecessary. I, I, I don't even know why. I, I thought everything has been better. You are there because we want you there. So it's the best place for you right now. They said the Cascade Mountain Range, and I was like, what? They're like, oh, this is a wilderness program. They tell you. You crawl under your tarp for the first time, and the ground really, really hard.
So why don't you just call out another pair of socks? You can't just call out another pair of socks. Why not? Dad has $8 for a pair of socks. I wonder what's the markup on those. Like, how much profit do you make? Well, I personally don't make any kind of profit on those. Then what is my mom going to say? Oh, what is your mom Something say? awful! Something really fucking awful and I just want my socks! Did you turn them into the laundry? No, I didn't. Into the laundry. Maybe they're in your pack. I know they're not in my pack! Maybe I just won't wear any. Wearing socks is an expectation. I mean, it's a rule. Call it a rule. It's an expectation. That's the same thing. No, it's not. You have rules, but you don't call them rules. You call them expectations or whatever. It's some kind of weird code. So you don't have to admit that you have rules here. Okay, yeah, they have rules. Where is my point? This is my point. <clears throat> I'm just saying maybe you should have your hat.
the door, apprehensive but also curious to see if I would open it on the poltergeist's part. But instead, it was a scene of clean tightness, of oppressed and disturbed. It appeared very 
everything had its place and its time, that nothing could change or move out of its order. There were people, new people, not present among them was a woman, one I had seen before, I knew well. She was tall, large, with a clean and a healthy deal of it piled on the top of her head. She was for company. She wore good clothes, expensive, fashionable, and inside them, her body seemed to be trying to assert itself. Her legs looked uncomfortable. She had not wanted to put on these clothes, but had felt she must. She was talking to a woman, visitor, Eyes, those eyes, unclouded by self criticism. Not see the woman she was to, nor the small child in her lap. Bump down energetically, nor the spring. Nor did she see the girl who stood away from her mother? What? Listening, all her senses stretched. As if every four took information, or warning, message. From this child emanated strong waves of painful emotion. It was guilt. <laughs> she was condemned. In the background, man, looking uncomfortable, he was a soldier or had been one. He was tall, well, but felt himself as if it were hard to maintain purpose or self-respect. His conventional handsome face was sensitive and easily pained, and it was half hidden by a large mustache. The wife and mother was talking. She talked. She talked. On and on, as if no one else but herself existed in that world, or beyond it. As if she were alone. So that the girl, particularly, who knew she was the chief culprit, the one being. But I simply didn't it. No one ever wants one. one is going to be. It is too much. By the time the end is. I'm not fit for anything at all but sleep. My mind is just a fog, a scramble. It's for reading or any serious sort of thing. Sleep oh, will wake me at six. Strangers stay quiet till seven. But from then on, I'm on the go, the go, the go, all day. Thing after another. And when you Time. I was quite known for my intelligence. That is, and still sat back in the chair smoking. The ash on his cigarette lengthened on itself and dropped. He um, gave his wife an irritated look, hastily pulled an ashtray toward him. In a way that said at this time, he should have remembered the ashtray before, but then he felt like that dropping ashes. He went out smoking. The rush of things, the meals one after another. Children, the 
the attention they should have. I know that Emily is very vocal and I have time to give her, but she's such a demanding child. She's always taking a lot out of it. She wants to be read to and played with all day, but I'm cooking. I'm ordering food. I have it all day. Well, how it is. There isn't time for what has to be done. I simply don't have time for the child. <laughs> I did manage to get a girl for a time last year, but that was more, more trouble than it was worth, really. All oh, their problems and crises, and you have to deal with them. But she took up so much of my time as Emily does. I get an hour to myself after lunch. I put my feet up for a bit. I didn't have the energy to read, let alone study. His guilt smoked on, listening. But what can you give out when you get nothing in? I'm exhausted by lunchtime, and all I want to do is sleep. And when you want to be capable of, I never thought of being tired. I never imagined I'd become the sort of woman who who would never have time to open a book. There it is. She sighed quite Child, that tall, solid comfort is understanding as a child was. She sat looking inward into the demands of the place in her nights, felt she was talking to herself. They could not hear or would not. She was trapped, but did not why she felt this. Her marriage and her children, what she personally had wanted and had what society had chosen for her. Nothing in her education or experience had prepared her for what she did in fact feel. And she was isolated in her distress and girl, Emily, had left the chair where she had been standing and holding tight to the arm, sheltering from the storm of abuse and criticism. She now went to her father and stood by his knee, watching this great, powerful woman, her mother, whose hands were so strong and so good. She was shrinking closer and closer to her father, seemed was unaware of her. He made a clumsy knocking off his ashtray, and his retrieval of it caused his elbow to jog Emily. <coughs> fell back away like something left behind. She put it to the floor and lay there, face downward on her hard accusing voice when on and on, would always go on, had always gone on. Nothing could stop it. These emotions, this pain, this guilt, and ever having been born at all, born to cause such pain and annoyance. On there forever could never be turned off. And even when the sound was turned off in memory, there must be a permanent pressure this resentment. In ordinary life, I'm the sound of a voice 
a bitter and low compliment just the other side of the fence. And was close behind the wall. Still oh
we're getting ready to start with just a quick warning about this piece. It is incredibly loud, and there's some very loud noises and sound effects throughout the piece. Thank you. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here. <laughs> um, so, welcome to our web. I am um, say our web because we're doing this again. That means you guys are going to be here. It's okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Great. So, webcast is back. I'm this camera. I'm streaming to my site. It's uh, Ed's Head TV. It's Ed's Head dot. Ed's Head dot me. That's why. Online. Edgehead.me. Hold it up in your phones. Cool. So this webcast is about dreams. I had a dream that I would uh, come to New York City and uh, play in a big uh, radio head. 
and uh, you sell a million fruits and you travel around the world to Festival, doing this for you, my 15 minute excerpt for all of you. Come on. To get started, does anybody have a dream that they would like to share? Like a dream, an aspiration, a career, destiny, that what? I'd love to just. Sure. Great. Anything else? Any kind of dream? You know, Freud says dreams come from our parents. Like, you know, if things are going well for me in New York, why not go back to my parents? You know, why not I go back to my middle class family, like beautiful suburban home, with some cool horses? Like, why, why don't I go home? And she chases me around the house trying to kiss me. What do I do? <laughs> I, I, I want to stab her. I, I want to run away. It's like, I've got all these thoughts that I don't want to think about and I don't want to talk about. Like, I keep thinking about all these different people walking in on it. Like me with my arm against the wall, with her leg in the air. And, and you can't see my face, just the back of my head. Like, I feel my face squishing up until it'll disappear. Like a thought that can minimize anyone into a projector image of your mother, spread eagle in your face. <laughs> <laughs> Me orgasm. <laughs> your mom walks in this theater right now with a blow up dummy of you, throws it on the ground, and starts crying. <laughs> you see the wetness on your face. <laughs> <laughs> your mom. You walk into your apartment you live in today, and your mom is lying on the couch naked. Your leg up behind her head so much more flexible than you could have ever imagined. <laughs> and straight into the good stuff. <laughs> Maybe that's why I don't go home. <laughs> I always feel cool when I get mad here. Like, things that are out of my control. I get mad at people too. Everybody's upset about something. About the prices, upset about the people that are pumping those prices up. It's like the whole city's gonna be totally homogenous one day. But from, from the Bronx to the Rockaways, glass tower filled with white people. Sending emails and making apps and starting arts nonprofits. <laughs> <laughs> this is no celebration now. It's all about the past. And everybody's gonna get fed up. It's no fun. There's no sense of spontaneity in it. Like like we're gonna happen across the next phenomenon that's tearing through. I don't know what, but but something. Like, where are the wild hearted that wanna tear through? They want to bury their teeth and just run through the city. I can't. I wish I could. But I need someone to do it. I can't be following the same path everyone else. Myself up to succeed and be busy. with people. 
people in New York and elsewhere. All that, the dream's here. <laughs> Be unpredictable. <laughs> Something it's just so you say no. It's only now that I've given it some more time. Desire to crash the bus with everybody on it. It comes as self kind of, some kind of self destruction, but it's the thinking of a thought and the grabbing of that thought and putting it somewhere and letting it sit for a long time and get moldy and stinky and walk it into your brain so where the fumes are there. And what happens when they talk to someone like a therapist? What are they told? That's what I don't know. That's what I don't understand. Do they tell them to hit something else? To hit a pillow? Do they tell them to go to anger management? Because if that's the case, then you're telling them that they are the only ones that have that thought and they're going to separate themselves from everyone. I think it's more comforting if we recognize that these thoughts come into all of us and then we 
and stop pretending. Pretending to what? Pretending to think, correct? Like we don't have our own experience. We should definitely bounce our thoughts off of what our society is, but we should not condemn them. We should know when they're wrong, when they don't match up. Like my thought of killing someone is socially acceptable. I should not say it in front of a larger audience. Because if there's somebody that doesn't understand it, it's just a thought. What if you don't have anybody that understands that? What do you do? Maybe that's what some of these guys go through. I say guys because there aren't a lot of girls, mostly guys, white guys. Why is that? If things are so terrible, why don't they leave? Why don't we walk away? I don't have a complete grasp of all of this. I can't talk about all of it, but I still feel it's inevitable. Why is the next one inevitable? They're all just a bunch of copycats. They're all just a bunch of copycats. I guess they're just... Let break one bus. I want my kith and kin to cover base. She is right. Ashamed of my birth. However, telling myself to be the child of fortune, goddess of gifts, will not go without honor with her. Small and large, the in my time sur surrounded me, and so will not exit so.
Good evening. We will be having a brief conversation tonight. Uh, I'll be moderating it, making sure we don't go too wildly off track. It's a little strange to be moderating people who I've never even met before, but I just saw your art, as did we all. And so, hello, welcome. Nice to meet all of you. Uh, I'm Eliza Bent, and wow, we were really faced with the problem of being alive here tonight. <laughs> the issue of being born. <laughs> the problem of being born through theater. <laughs> oh, me? Oh, uh, wow. That's a good question. Um, We're here to do big things. At oh, oh. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, I can just give a little context about the being bornness in in dead time. Um, it, it's basically Doris Lessing in 1963 fostered a kid, um, a very troubled young woman, for about three years. And ten years later, she wrote a book called The Memoirs of a Survivor. And in it, she sort of reconciled or deals with the relationship she had with this kid. But she also... Uh, in the guise of like writing about this kid's mother, really just writing about her own mother. So that mother is more likely Doris Lessing's mother than Jenny Dis. And the woman is actually a writer herself now named Jenny Diskin, and she's actually um, writes for the London Review of Books and is dying right now of cancer and is writing a log and writing for the first time about her relationship to Doris Lessing. So. It's a kind of crazy. So we've been reading a lot of her books as well. And she had a horrible mother. Um, but I think mostly, <laughs> mostly I think the mother in, in memoirs is about Doris Lessing's mother. Cool. Can, can everybody introduce themselves? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I just great, I great do idea. know Eliza, so I just felt like, uh, no, I'm Mallory Catlett. Sorry. Mallory did the second piece. Second piece, Dead Time of Plenty. Yes. yes. My name is Asa Horvitz. My name is Ryan Pater. Annie Hamburger. And I'm, I'm Seth Boakley. Great. I'm glad we got that through. I'm glad we did that. Well, what about you guys? What do you think about, about this being question? born? Yeah. Uh, it's inevitable. I mean, it, it's, it was a theme. Mothers were a theme, I, I felt, even more than uh, being born. Uh, but uh, how do I answer that question? I guess um, we're, we're, we're interested. I was with the first piece, the piece about wilderness therapy for teenagers, and I, I suppose we are looking at um, generational issues and issues of the, the cycle, a cycle of behaviors that, um, you know, the, the, the mother character in this case is um, sort of seeking to uh, understand there's this gulf of, of, uh, of generations. And I guess we're looking at, among other things, the question of uh, misunderstanding and the kind of wilderness of misunderstanding that can occur between generations. And our, our text is largely based on interviews that we've done with, you know, uh, kids and, and parents who have gone through these wilderness therapy programs. But I guess our piece, we're, 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 we're trying to show that, that despite all this effort and there's huge progress that can be made through these kind of thera extreme therapeutic interventions sending kids out to the Utah desert, that that gulf of understanding probably is going to persist and maybe there is something um, about being born in that. Maybe that's inevitable. <laughs> Try to circle around, Eliza, to where you started. Please, take it away. Um. <laughs> uh, I think for me, um, Oedipus is a tragedy about what happens when you, uh, when a, a group of people believe too closely in their stories about themselves. So it's about the prophecy and about the belief in that prophecy and what happens when you believe in the story that you have about yourself and don't realize that you're believing in the story that you have about yourself. And that led us to young white men and mass shootings and also um, to, like Moms is like a subtext 
you know, but it kind of, I think it's not, I actually don't think that Oedipus is primarily about incest, although that's what, you know, that's, that's kind of more like a riff on how we understand it, because that's how we do think about it, because Freud put that at the center of how we understand ourselves. So I don't, I don't have a problem with being born so much as w what you believe about, what you come to believe about yourself, whether it's from your parents or from yourself or from your society. Well, and it, I'm glad you bring up the word society because we have in all of these pieces, with, along with the issues of existing in the world and being born and moms, we also have a lot of society and individual things coming up. Would anyone of you care to comment on that? Um, I can comment on it. So I'm a mom. Um, and uh, Great. I have, thanks, thanks. Maybe I'm really pro-mom. Oh, I feel like we should dad. have said that. I don't know. Are you, no? I'm, you know, as, I have a You have a good, that's good, good. I'm glad that makes me feel good. You do too. Okay, good. <laughs> anyway, um, so it's been, uh, before I had kids, I was under the false impression that I, as an artist, I was just going to throw them over my shoulder and keep going. Um, it's funny now in retrospect, and I have 18 year old twins, and I, one of the things that I've become very hyper conscious about is the, all the pressures on kids, um, in term, and I think, I do think it's worse than when I was a teenager in terms of, um, the easy access to drugs, the escalating, um, suicide rate, which is, um, five times what it was even five years ago. Um, do the easy access of heroin. Um, I think that these days every kid in high school feels like they need to invent um, new forms of rocket science or cure cancer um, in order to get into a decent college. And I think teenagers are hyper-conscious about um, the cost of college. And I think we over-program kids, and I think we um, don't connect with things like playing in mud, getting dirty, and the outdoors. And I think all of that converges on a lot of um, mental health issues. And I think the one thing that has always surrounded mental health and still does is shame and secrecy. And so um, we're engaged in this multimedia piece that we've been developing over the course of eight months to really talk about all these issues, not just in a kind of bang you over the head, okay, now I need to go to sleep after I see the show, but to look at the humor in it, the humanness, the complexity of relationships, the unknowable gulf between parents and kids, which I think there always is. Um, and um, the redemption and hope. Great, thanks. Uh, she meant, obviously we were talking a little bit about teenagers and this notion of teenness. I felt even cropped up in the other pieces too, this idea of adolescence. How did you feel like adolescence is springing up in your pieces? Even if you weren't necessarily portraying teenagers, I felt, I was especially struck in your piece how with teens, there's so, the emotion is so much on the surface of them and I felt certainly in our character of the man and his uh, <laughs> webcast. And even also in your piece too, Mallory, that oh, there was a lot of emotion on the surface sort of teen quality? Um, I'll just say, I, I guess the, the source material is very interesting to me because it, it situates an older woman and a, like a 12-year-old girl and a, she has a dog. So I'm really interested in like, these are time periods in people's lives where they're transitioning, but they're also, we kind of don't want to look at those moments. And I think that that's something about um, being a teenager or being that, especially, well, I'll only speak as, like, in this story, it's a girl. Um, and so I think that it's really, for me, I'm really interested in looking at those bodies um, and, um, like, what the conversation is between them. And I find, in at least in Dead Time, there's this really interesting, very kind of awkward relationship between an older woman trying to take care of a, a teenage girl who, and they have no relationship. So it's, for me, it's a fascinating um, book about the intricacies of, of that relationship and the awkwardness of it. Um, so, I, I mean, that, I think that's all I have to say. Great. <laughs> I think you hit most of the, the important points. Well, I think there's some things to be said about the, 
the webcast and uh, oh, yeah. like yeah. Um, you know uh, our characters um, he thinks the, the, the best way for him to reach out is, is through this webcast um, and I think that that's from the generation that he grew up in um, which is mine um, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> um, uh, so yeah I mean and, and, and allowing these these thoughts that he can't really uh, breach in day to day, allowing them to come up in a, in a space that uh, perhaps there's someone out there that will uh, connect with. Although I will say that I think it's a kind of mystery, like that age and that period and those transition periods, like I don't understand them and I don't have a proposal, I don't like have a solution in that way and I'm, I'm really interested in coming up against that place where like I don't get it and I don't have a, I don't have a, we don't have a solution, there's no solution. It's, there doesn't seem to be a solution. A, a solution? Oh, I just feel like sometimes when, when the topic of adolescent males and violence comes up, that people immediately leap to solutions, and that's that's come up around our work before. It's like, what solution are you proposing? And it's like, well, we're not. Yeah, and I think I think that even before we talk about solutions, we talk about pathology, right? That the the, the whole idea that that something is um, that, that that we can put a name on, sort of bad behaviors and put them in a box and say, how do we, you know, how do we both anticipate which, to your point of fate and, you know, what, what are we fated to do? What are we expected to do? <clears throat> and then how do we then circumvent or avoid or, uh, those behaviors? And, and I think in, in our piece too, we, we, you know, we look at a character that we didn't, we didn't show a lot of uh, today, but the character of Cole, who just is this young man who participates in these incredibly risky behaviors. And in our interview, you know, we, it's a documentary piece, so we do a lot of these we have a lot of this interview text, and I think um, I, I'm interested in the fact that Cole can't explain why he did what he did, and actually is, in, is unable to give a very good explanation for what went wrong, what trauma caused him to behave this way, or what, you know, he doesn't have an explanation. And I, and I think that's also, it's also important to leave space for the behaviors that don't have an explanation to, of course, whatever, support that person and make sure that our society is one that can allow that to happen in a safe way as best we can but also not to path immediately pathologize it and reduce it to a single, like, I don't know, diagnosis either of a generation or of a gender or, or anything. You know. We don't have a ton of time left, and I wonder if the audience has any particular questions. Yeah. induced delusion took his mother's life and he has the keys to my apartment as well uh, he's my friend and I think a lot of what we miss and what we tend to diagnose is misdiagnosed and a lot of it is socialization some people are given too much and are spoiled and some people aren't given anything uh, damage from that. I have a lot of friends who are like that, who I care about, and who I do try and give them a voice. And I loved your piece, Ryan, because it really touched on the internal dialogue that a lot of people have that they really can't deal with. And that depth of perception in the quietness of their mind, the revolving door, and the, and the biochemical create a trauma. And I think a lot of what we really need to do, and what I've been exploring in one of my documentaries called Psychophobia, is rethinking how we think about mental illness. And I think maybe that's what you guys are really talking about. Bravo. Thank you. Are you all doing that? <laughs> <laughs> Doing that. Um, I, I, no, I mean, I think what I'm thinking about is sort of about, um, I guess this is one piece of, this is sort of, there's a diptych of two pieces. So I'm thinking more about kind of human evolution, I guess, and like how, how one evolves um, in differing circumstances to, in this case, when it's a kind of world where the familial structures are going away. So I'm really interested in how this relationship between an older woman and this younger girl in a, in a totally different kind of world, like 
how we have, what we have to do to take care of one another um, and rethinking what that is, like what motherhood is um, and how this girl then takes care of other kids. And so for me, it's a lot about, so I guess in a sense, like it is about like how we might remake those relationships. Um, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm interested too in this notion about uh, the idea of offering a solution. Was there more, I'm seeing a head shake over here and. I mean, a solution to what, you yeah, know? Exactly. Like, I mean, uh, because you yeah, both all, commented on it, so I'm curious that, yeah. to delve into that a bit I mean, deeper. Which, I, I don't even know what is, what's, what's the, the problem solution. problem of being born, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I guess, you know. <laughs> I, I think, I don't. I think there's a way forward, which is different than a solution. I mean, one of the things I feel like I've learned personally in the, this work that we've done is that people tend to normalize dysfunction. And I would say as a parent, also, it's very hard to look yourself in the mirror and go, this is outside of my control, and I'm not what my kid needs right now. That is very hard for a parent to do. And sometimes that's just the truth that kids need things that you can't give them. Um, and especially kids that are highly sensitive, highly creative, and end up kind of going off the rails for a whole myriad of different reasons. But there's no one-size-fits-all to any of it. I think if there's any solution, it's just about being awake, try to stay connected, and try to talk about where you're coming from. And that's a methodology rather than a solution. I think, I think uh, uh, that last piece was a kind of a nice uh, wake-up call, you know, to use your, your phrase, Annie. Like, I, I felt very open by it, and I really um, I enjoyed that I didn't see the turn coming at all in, in sort of where, where it was going, the, the Oedipus piece, that um, didn't see the, the shooter engaged in that until it was sort of too late, and I felt the kind of um, the trap of that uh, really... Um, I don't know. It, it it certainly did. It woke me up, and I don't. I don't think art needs to offer a solution. I do think that it, as you said, put you into the into a, a, a different mindset that I can look back on and and you know and wonder about and and look then out into the world and see where I identify it. But for me, it was much more of a kind of it was a it was a good wake up call, and it was really loud. Yeah. I, I just want to say one thing, which is just that our performers came from. Pace University Theater School, and uh, they're really terrific, and I'd like to give them a shout out. So. Any? Yeah. Disorientation rather than pathology, because what we're trying to do is stabilize one's relationship to the world and they are more often disoriented than they are uh, mentally disturbed. I feel kind of disoriented. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't know. Um, I definitely just, I don't, I was moved by what you shared, and I, I feel like whatever people are experiencing, I'm happy with that, and I'd like to hear what people took from our work, and that's, it's in the work for me, like I don't, I don't know whether I'm working on. If he understood that I'm working on mental illness in that area, that's great. Um, no, it's really it's, it's moving for you. But I think there's a kind of gray area that happens between us that I'm I'm interested. In. So thank you. <laughs> I was looking to see if maybe it was time to. We, we can. We can wrap. Other questions or comments from the audience? Maybe we should just live in this gray area that we ended on. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you.